Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So I, um, I just love worship in all sorts of ways. And this morning, um, as we were worshiping, and some singing and some listening, and <clears throat> some of you on key and some of us off key, um, a little boy behind me was whistling um, through the songs. And, and you kept the tune really well. Good job. Um, I loved that. I, I thought that was um, thought that was really cool, and I knew you probably couldn't hear it, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, <clears throat> words are in, incredibly powerful tools. I mean, they can be used as medicine to heal people. Um, they can be used in ways that bring life to people, and and they can be used as weapons to tear down and to destroy. It's important always for us to be conscientious about the words that we choose to use and the words that we choose to say to one another and about one another. It's important what we choose to say to others about Jesus. It has been said that the three most important words that we speak to one another and hear from one another are the words, I love you. I, I love you. And, and I, I agree, those are three very important words. I, I like to hear them. I like to say them. I end every conversation with my children with the words, I love you. Um, a few months ago, I was at a conference. I'm a part of a group with Texas Methodist Foundation. It's made up of associate pastors in large United Methodist churches across the South. And we meet quarterly every year. We usually hear a speaker. And a few months ago, I was at one of those conferences and while I was there, I got a couple of uh, text messages from our director of student ministries, Aaron Buttery, that he needed to talk to me. And so as soon as we took a break, I, I went out and I, I called him to see what he needed. And so we talked and I tried to answer his questions. And, and then I was trying to get in a hurry because the, the guy's going to start speaking again. Everybody in the group is like, come on, come on, Lorinda. And so I'm trying to kind of hurry and I get back with the group and we're walking back in. And I said, okay, so you have everything from me that you need, right? Right. Okay, I'll talk to you later. And he said, talk to you later. And I said, love you. Wait, 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 what? Um, okay, so I've known Aaron Buttery a really long time. I mean, I knew him when he was a student at A&M, and, and we've kept up with each other throughout our lives. And I do really love the guy, but we don't end our conversations typically at work with love ya. Um, it was, was really awkward, and so it was just silent. <laughs> and everyone in my group just stopped and went, and looked at me like, did you just, did you just tell Someone that you're the supervisor, that, that you love them? And so it's silent. No one says anything. And finally, Aaron Buttery says, well, Lorinda, I love you too. <laughs> and I said, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> we went back in the room, and every, you know, the whole group uh, does, will not ever let me live that down. Um, and so <laughs> sometimes, you know, you want to say I love you to somebody, but it just seems like maybe not the thing. No, I don't know if it's the good thing to say or if it's the right time to say it. I don't know. So a really good friend of mine named Susan Branham, today's her birthday. Um, she told, I met her when she was a student at A&M, and she told me that um, she'd noticed that sometimes when I say to people, see you later, alligator, that it's kind of my way of saying, I love you. See you later, alligator. And so I started thinking about it, and I started noticing it kind of, it's kind of true. Uh, instead of being like, saying to Aaron Buttery or people that I work with, I love you. <laughs> it's just better to be, see you later, alligator. And for deeply theological reasons, I plan to have that written on my tombstone. <laughs> see you later, alligator. I want to suggest to you this morning that while yes, I love you are the three most important words that we hear and speak to one another in our lifetimes, I want to suggest to you this morning that the three most powerful words the three most powerful words we hear and we speak in this lifetime are the words, He is risen. He is risen. The three most powerful words we will hear and speak in this lifetime, He is risen. Now, I want you to know you will, if you know me, you've probably never heard me um, speak with any kind of an agenda about being a woman in ministry. I, I don't get into debates or arguments about being a female pastor. I just try to live out what God's called me to do and not get too bent out of shape about anything. But I want you to allow me just this one time, okay? Just this one time, okay? The very first Easter sermon 
was preached by a woman. It was preached by a woman because Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. They were bringing the spices. And when they get there, Jesus isn't there. He is risen. The angel appears to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And, and, and the angel tells him, he's not here. He is risen. Now, go and tell the others. Go and tell the disciples, speak the words, let people hear the words. He is risen. In other words, I believe the angel said to Mary Magdalene, go preach it, girl. Go preach it. He is risen. And that's exactly what Mary Magdalene and the other Mary did. They ran to tell the other disciples, this is news that cannot be kept to ourselves. It's not a conversation. They're like, are you he risen? He's risen. Mm -hmm. No, he is risen. He is risen indeed. I want you to say that with me three times. Ready? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Those three words are packed full of hope. They're filled with life. They're filled with promise and they're filled with joy. Hope and joy and life and promise in the three words, he has risen. So what if I switch gears for just a moment and tell you that while, yes, these three words are packed full of hope and joy and life and promise, that they, those three words can also have be filled with some doubt. Some doubt, and that may be not what we want to hear. Sometimes as as Christians, we break out in an allergic reaction when somebody asks us difficult questions or tells us that they're doubting God. We go into anaphylactic shock because we don't want anybody to ask any questions. And it's important for us to be able to do that. It's important for us to be able to ask the questions. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples. And if you're wondering if doubt can be found in the Easter story, I mean, because a lot of times that's really not what we want to talk about on Easter Sunday, right? We don't want to talk about doubt, but yet there are so many who do. And yet there are so many of us that even in moments of great faith, we find ourselves wondering. We find ourselves wondering, can this be true? And I would suggest to you this morning that the three most challenging and the three and the three and the three most concerning words. Or I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thomas, he's been with Jesus for three years. He's watched him. He's heard him preach and pray. He's watched him heal and save. He's witnessed Jesus perform miracles. He's been right there, right there when Jesus performed miracles. And yet doubt is found in Thomas's story. Doubt. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament book of John. We're going to be looking at chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. If you do not have your Bibles with you, the words are on the screen. I want to invite you to stand and as you hear and as you receive the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, unless I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And all the do although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see. See my hands. 
reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that it speak a new word and new life into each and every one of us today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this story uh, has been used a lot to talk about doubting Thomas. And I don't know why, but I've always kind of thought of Thomas as probably a pretty good guy. You know, but yet people say things like, oh, don't be a doubting Thomas, even if they don't know the origin of the word. You know, they're like, don't be a doubting Thomas. He kind of gets, I would say, a bad rap. You know, I mean, the guy just, he needs to see, and his words are, you know, like, I'm just, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And sometimes in those moments of, of deep pain, in those moments of grief, uh, we can cry out, I'm not sure. And Jesus, the story really is about Jesus. It's not about Thomas. It's about Jesus. And it's about Jesus' response to Thomas's doubt and Thomas's disbelief. And how does Jesus respond? Because he's not, he's not, Thomas isn't there the first time Jesus appears to the disciples and speaks to them. And so he says, unless I see for myself, like all of you did, unless I see for myself, unless I can place my hand in the nail scars on his hand. I will not believe. And Jesus appears a second time with Thomas there. And he doesn't come in there with accusatory questions or with anger or with bitterness. But he goes directly to Thomas and he addresses his need for additional faith. His need for additional faith. He goes to him and tells him, peace be with you. Now reach out and, and touch. Now some people have suggested that Jesus is being sarcastic in this moment. I don't buy that at all. I don't see that at all in this scripture. I see compassion and caring on the part of Jesus. You need your faith restored, Thomas. And that's what Jesus was there to do. So many times in our lives, we, we experience things where we need our faith restored. But we might be afraid to let anyone know that for fear they'd go into shock. Can we ask these kinds of questions? Are we comfortable asking these kinds of questions? Can, can we say, I, I need my faith restored? Because I'm telling you, when we say it, Jesus is there, not with accusatory questions, not with anger or bitterness. He is there with kindness and compassion and grace to restore our faith. So ask the questions. Church should be a place where you can come and be truthful and ask questions, not a place that you come and hide from the truth. Can we worship even in our disbelief? In the New Testament book of Matthew, we're told about the, the story that after the resurrection, a group of people gathered on a hill to worship. And Matthew says that among them were a bunch of doubters, a bunch of doubters. So yes, I'm comfortable saying that on any given Sunday, it happens more often than we realize most of the time rather than just some of the time or not at all. People worship even with some disbelief and some doubt. And I want to tell you that when we ask the right questions at the right time, it can change everything. The right question asked at the right time can change the world. So don't ignore your questions. Don't ignore them. The right questions are a gift to us from God that lead us back to the truth. The right questions are gifts to us from God. Those questions lead us back to the truth. If we don't ask them, we're still stuck where we are. Ask the questions. This past December the 6th, Helen Anderson, mother of Charles Anderson, our senior pastor, died of a long illness that required a tremendous amount of care from Charles and, and, his, and his family. And on the morning of December the 7th, just hours after her death, Helen's husband of 63 years, Terry Anderson, Charles's dad, sent Charles an email. And I have permission from Charles and Mr. Anderson to share this email with you today. He titled his email, Expectations. Charles, your words and wisdom carry more weight with me than anyone else's. Down deep, 
Do you think I will ever see mom again? That is, will she recognize me and I her everlastingly? Is life hereafter just a comforting myth? Or does it have substance, charade, or certainty? You have bet your life professionally and personally on the Christian doctrine. You must feel pretty sure about certain tenets. What is your answer? Will I join mom someday? It will have an effect on my approach to my remainder life. Love, Dad. Charles read that email to me right after he'd received it, and we both sat in his office and cried together. Terry Anderson, a man, I've loved him since the day I met him and saw his deep love for his granddaughter, Lindsay. And that email holds no anger, no bitterness, just painful questioning. Is there really doubt or really a need for additional faith? We all stand in some very different places throughout our lives. We stand in great moments of joy, and we stand in great moments of sorrow. And in both of those places, we can often find ourselves saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I need additional faith. And those questions are a gift to you from God, questions that will lead you back to the truth, questions that ask at the right moment can change your life and change the world. It will have an effect on my approach to my remainder life. Yes, Mr. Anderson, it most definitely will. It was true for Thomas, it was true for Terry Anderson, and it's true for all of us. The answer to our questions about God and faith and resurrection will have an effect on the remainder of our lives and on our eternity as well. There's a difference between believing that Jesus was raised from the grave and believing that it applies to your life. So I appreciate that willingness. Maxie Dunham tells the story of when his mother and father were together and his mother was on her deathbed and his father was holding her hand. And the last words his mother ever spoke to his father were, I'll see you. They have that engraved on his tombstone, on her tombstone. The last words Maxie Dunham's father ever spoke to his mother were, I will be there. I'll be there. And they had those engraved on his tombstone. What a witness to the confidence in the resurrection, in the resurrection promise. In the resurrection promise, the three most important words that we will speak in our lives and believe and believe apply to our lives are the words, he is risen. The promise is a promise of resurrection, a promise of resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And so I would ask you this morning, what is it that you need to ask? What is it that you need to do so that you can be led back to the truth of that promise of resurrection? And then I want to encourage you deeply and strongly to begin praying, to seek out the people who will talk to you, to seek out those answers so that you can come to a place in your life where you stand firmly, firmly, in the assurance of the resurrection promise and where you can proclaim with great confidence, he is risen. Let's pray together. God, I thank you, we thank you, and we praise you that you love us enough that if we doubt, when we have questions, you, you are there, you are there to lead us back to the truth. You are there for an experience of faith restoration so this morning, God, where we have doubted you, we, we pray, God, that you will restore our faith, our faith in the promise, our faith in the resurrection, our faith in the knowledge he has risen. All this we pray in his name. Amen.